the doorways that organize our lives, our relational sites of continual transition, union, segregation, secrecy, envelopment, and vision. They persist as cultural talismans that usher us in and out of the various structures of our lives and reside in our deepest memories as pauses and portals between the consciousnesses of our past. The threshold is that which allows us to inhabit and be embedded in the architectural Dingwelt. The following theorists and philosophers demythologize and expand the meaning of the doorway in our beliefs and in our memories. The door, philologically, is a point of relationality between and among spaces. In her most recent work, Toward a Minor Architecture, architectural theorist Jill Stoner addresses the function of the door. She writes, door shares its Indo-European root dwer with forest. This linguistic kinship suggests that the two worlds function similarly in early language, that they referred to the non-domestic, the doorway out. All doors lead outward toward the forest, away from the inexorable domestication through which all sense of the original primordial forest has been erased. From a cultural and historical perspective, the door does not separate interiors from exteriors. It is at once a state of permanence and change that implies an origin and a distinct mode of being for the subject moving between spaces. Walter Benjamin, uh, a progenitor of thing theory, writes in The Work of Art in the Age of Mechanical Reproduction of architecture's sanctity, aura, its ability to relate subject and art object, he writes very famously, its history is more ancient than that of any other art, and its claim to being a living force has significance in every attempt to comprehend the relationship of the masses to art. Buildings are appropriated in a twofold manner by uh, touch and sight, use and perception. Architecture, depths, and doorways figure significantly in, uh, in his memoirs as well. In a Berlin Chronicle, he describes his lost drawing of a diagram as a labyrinth. And for those of you who are familiar with Walter Benjamin's work uh, and life, of course, he lost the drawing. He explains, I am not concerned here with what is installed in the chamber at its en enigmatic center, ego or fate, but all the more with the many entrances leading into the interior. These entrances I call primal acquaintances, so many relationships, so many entrances to the maze. Benjamin's doorway is mythic in its suggestion of origins materially and socially relating the ancient history of mass with individual. But he goes further in his mystical and anecdotal survey of 19th century materiality. He describes playing hide and seek in Berlin as a child, uh, and he considers how one actually becomes the door. He writes, here I was enveloped in a world of matter. The child who stands behind the doorway curtain himself becomes something white that flutters, a ghost. And behind the door, he is himself the door. He is decked out in it like a weighty mask, and as sorcerer will cast a spell on all who enter unawares. Benjamin's story is both magical and disconcerting, a statement and also a warning of our embeddedness in an identification with the world of objects. In The Poetics of Space, Gaston Bachelard similarly complicates the conventional relationality of the door in the pursuit of what he calls topoanalysis or the systematic psychological study of the sites of our intimate lives. Bachelard's intimacy with space is embedded in individual and collective fantasies and memories, or what he calls oneirism. One topo analysis is the dialectics of outside and inside. 
he describes the formal opposition of insides and outsides, which is inherent to alienation. The universe of speech governs all the phenomena of being, relating linguistic oppositions to what is open and closed in a person. He describes the person as a surface that wishes to be both visible and hidden, much like the doorway, enti an entire cosmos of the half open. In the same way that Stoner's doorway joins and blurs the boundary between nature and culture, uh, forest and built environment, so Bachelard also joins interior and exterior subject and doorway. Uh, many architectural theorists have noted a similar relationship between body and building. In Body, Memory, and Architecture, Bloomer and Moore suggest a correspondence between the bodily boundary and the threshold of a house or a house boundary. Uh, the front doors and facades almost always exhibit a measure of symmetry, uh, characteristic of body posture where the eyes and the ears are focused for defense. Martin Heidegger offers an ontology of the body in motion in his essay, Building Dwelling Thinking. He writes, to say that mortals are is to say that in dwelling, they persist through spaces by virtue of their stay among things and locations. And only because mortals pervade, persist through spaces by their very nature are they able to go through spaces. <laughs> When I go toward the door of the lecture hall, I am already there. And I could not go to it at all if I were not such that I am there. I am never here only as this encapsulated body. Rather, I am there. That is, I already pervade the room and only thus can I go through it. The body's motion toward and being in the doorway is reciprocal with its state of dwelling and mortality. For Heidegger, to pass through is to live. In theory, the body and structure are joined in all the ways that I've already mentioned. Maurice Merleau-Ponty contends that they are also phenomenologically, sensually united, that the body, quote, cannot be compared to the physical object, but rather the work of art. He describes works of art as individuals, beings in which the expression cannot be extinguished from the expressed, whose sense is only accessible through direct contact, and who send forth their signification without ever leaving their temporal and spatial place. Similar to Benjamin's doorway as both mask and person hidden by the door, Merleau-Ponty describes the state of the body as that which is container and contained. He writes, I am in my body, or rather, I am my body. Merleau-Ponty offers a phenomenological relationship between the body and the architectural world. In Phenomenology of Perception, he defines a world as an open and indefinite multiplicity where relations are reciprocally implicated. An architectural world, then, is a world in which architectures and experiencing bodies are reciprocally implicated. Merleau-Ponty posits the reciprocity of objects in a world. Quote, I can see one object insofar as objects form a system or a world, and insofar as each of them arranges the others around itself like spectators of its hidden aspects and as the guarantee of their permanence." End quote. As in Heidegger's description of the door, Merleau-Ponty understands vision and the gaze as central to being and participation in the world. He describes this gaze as uh, a manner of reaching the object. To see is to enter into a universe of beings that show themselves. To see an object is to come to inhabit it and to thereby grasp all things according to the sides these other things turn toward this object. To exist in a world of objects and structures is to be both embedded in and to inhabit those spaces. 
at the same time that objects of our architectural worlds embed themselves in each other, so our gaze allows us to inhabit architectures. The house from Merleau-Ponty is a site of visual reciprocity and envelopment. He writes, the house itself is not the house seen from nowhere, but rather the house seen from everywhere. The fully realized object is translucent. It is shot through from all sides by an infinity of gazes. He proposes, as does Benjamin, uh, in his call to the use of structures, to the use of doorways, uh, a primordial spatiality of which objective space is but the envelope and which merges with the very being of the body. Despite the noted ocular centrism of Merleau-Ponty's theory, uh, much of his philosophy includes the combination of vision and synesthesia. Uh, for example, in his writing of the arm seen and the arm touched together performing a single gesture, right? Arm seen, arm touched. The movement of the body in and through architectures is part of that enveloping experience. Merleau-Ponty uh, argues to have the experience of a structure is not to receive it passively in itself, it is to live it, to take it up, to assume it, and to uncover its imminent sense. In the world of fiction, William Faulkner truly uncovers the structure, describing in detail the bodily sensations that accompany our daily travels through doorways, the exact weight of a specific body as it crosses, the rhythm and cadence of feet as they fall onto planks, the proportions, shapes, and textures of limbs and materials. In the same way that phenomenology is a descriptive philosophy, so Faulkner's fiction is descriptive narrative and also philosophy. In the act of passing through fictive doorways, Faulkner narrativizes a sensuously enveloping architecture that transcends the mythic function of the door. William Faulkner, in his writing of 19 novels between the years 1926 and 1962, became known for his performance of Southern Place through high modernist aesthetics. He comments on his creation of Yaknapatafa County, which is an invented term uh, in relation to the real life, quote, uh, Mississippi, Lafayette County, and town of Oxford, uh, a word that he said means in the native language of the Chickasaw tribe there, water runs through flat land, although no sources could ever confirm that. He comments, I discovered that my own little posted stamp of native soil was worth writing about and that I would never live long enough to exhaust it. And by sublimating the actual into apocryphal, I would have complete liberty. I created a cosmos of my own. Certainly in Faulkner's <laughs> comment, we hear a Jungian F echo of mythic collectivity essential to Faulkner's creation of Yaknapatafa are his manifest manifestations of philosophy and subjectivity in uh, material culture. For example, he writes in his novel Sartorus, time and its furniture. Uh, there you have the pairing of uh, philosophy and material, time and its furniture. Thomas S. Hines notes in William Faulkner and the Tangible Past, when Faulkner was not living amongst the varied forms of Greek revival buildings of the Old South in Oxford, Mississippi, he had a great deal of architectural exposure uh, with his friend and traveling companion, architect William Spratling, whom he lived with in New Orleans in 1925 and traveled around Europe whilst Faulkner wrote and Spratling sketched. Uh, buildings, various buildings to be published in architectural forum. 
As Heinz points out, Faulkner's fiction is filled with specific arch architectures of his place and time, uh, those of folk vernacular, neoclassical, neo-Gothic, high Victorian, modernist, and public sculptures. An image that persists in uh, his world is the threshold in its many manifestations. Faulkner uses doorways throughout his fiction, often in, re in relation to various subjectivities and Southern society. His doorways act as reorienting emblems of imperialism, often in relation to class, race, and gender. We might think here of the uh, feminized doorway or the feminized threshold in Absalom, Absalom. Thomas Sutpen lives in his house, Sutpen's Hundred, without a doorway, without a window, and only builds one when he decides to take on a wife, right? Um, here we might think of The Sound and the Fury, where Quentin Compson III uh, finds her way out of a window, away from the Compson family forever, in which the, the window functions as a threshold. He repeatedly dramatizes what we call, uh, what he calls as well, the, quote, boy symbol at the door in Absalom, Absalom. In the following scene, Tom, Thomas Suppen recalls approaching a plantation house that is socially and economically beyond his reach as a poor white young man. The doorway serves as an ideological portal a myth of material and capitalist apotheosis, referred to throughout the novel as the design, getting richer and richer. Quote, he would never again need to stand on the outside of a white door and knock at it, and not at all for mere shelter, but so that that boy, that whatever nameless stranger, could shut that door himself forever behind him on all that he had ever known and look ahead. For Suppen, potential transformation is restricted by the doorman and the door itself. Despite the prevalence of threshold in his work, there are only a few select texts in which Faulkner narrates the phenomenological body in relation to architectures and doorways. The boy symbol at the door appears in the short story, Barn Burning, which I've just read with my students, where young Sartorus Snopes and his father Abner, a poor white sharecropper, approach the plantation house of his father's new employer. Sardi is described as walking on in the spell of the house. In this passage, Faulkner gives us the whole body interacting with the material threshold. Let me say, out of a 25-page short story, this description takes roughly three to four pages. My students can verify this. Uh, Faulkner devotes a, a large portion to this story, to this single gesture. I will not read those four or five pages. I will read only a section. He saw the house for the first time, and at that instant, he forgot his father and the terror and despair both. And even when he remembered his father again, who had not stopped, the terror and despair did not return. It's big as a courthouse. They are safe from him. People whose lives are a part of this peace and dignity are beyond his touch. He no more than a buzzing wasp, the spell of this peace and dignity, rendering even the barns and stable and cribs which belong to it impervious to the puny flames he might contrive. Maybe he will feel it too. Maybe it will even change him now from what maybe he couldn't help but be. They cross the portico. Now he could hear his father's stiff foot as it came down on the boards with clock-like finality, a sound out of all proportion to the displacement of the body it bore and which was not dwarfed by anything. The flat, wide black hat, the formal coat of broadcloth 
which had once been black, but had now that friction glazed greenish cast of the bodies of old house flies. The lifted sleeve, which was too large, the lifted hand like a curled claw, the door opened so promptly that the boy knew the Negro must have been watching them all the time. An old man with neat grizzled hair in a linen jacket who stood barring the door with his body saying, wipe your foots, white man, for you come in here. Major ain't home no how. His father, without heat, too, flinging the door back and the Negro also and entering, his hat still on his head, and now the boy saw the prints of the stiff foot on the door sill and saw them appearing on the pale rug behind the machine-like deliberation of the foot which seemed to bear or transmit twice the weight which the body compassed. The Negro is shouting, Miss Lula, Miss Lula, somewhere behind them. Then the boy, deluged as though by a warm wave of suave turn of carpeted stair and a pendant glitter of chandeliers and a mute gleam of gold frames, heard the swift feet and gown with lace. End quote. In this passage, Faulkner writes some of the most phenomenological and mimetic narration of architecture in relation to experiencing bodies. He describes what it is to be in and move through the built environment. Faulkner's plantation house threshold is not only ideological, it is a, an immersive and sensuous experience. In his work, doorways act as sites most impressionable and impressive to our sensing and acting bodies. He describes a threshold that joins self and world, smooth and striated spaces, as said by Jill Stoner. Sardi believes in the myth of the doorway as a site of separation and transformation. He confuses wealth and status with virtue, hoping that his father will feel the doorway too, and that it will even change him into a better and specifically feeling man. Instead, Sardi discovers that the doorway is a site of promiscuity where Abner Snopes drags the manure from the outside in, disavowing spatial segregation. Faulkner's novel Sanctuary, published in 1931 and written according to Faulkner for the purpose of making money, is historically viewed as his popular attempt at pulp and detective fiction. Uh, an important architectural note here, the proceeds from his publication of Sanctuary was his only substantial income, mostly throughout his life, and it was the only income that allowed him to buy his own plantation house, uh, Roanoke, former plantation house, of course. The novel tells the story of Temple Drake, a Mississippi college student who is abducted and raped by Popeye, a bootlegger, lifelong criminal, and social deviant guilty of murder. Horace Benbow, a lawyer recently estranged from his family and having returned home, decides to take on Popeye's murder case in an attempt to clear the name of another falsely accused man. There are two primary sites of envelopment uh, architectural envelopment, that is, throughout the novel. One is the rural headquarters for Popeye's bootlegging operation, the old Frenchman place, and the brothel in Memphis, where Temple is hidden after being abducted. The Frenchman place, as focalized through Temple, as seen and spoken of by her, uh, is the following. The house came into sight above the cedar grove, beyond whose black interstices an apple orchard flaunted in the sunny afternoon. It was set in a ruined lawn, surrounded by abandoned grounds and fallen outbuildings. But nowhere was any sign of husbandry, plow or tool. In no direction was a planted field in sight, only a gaunt, weather-stained ruin in a somber grove through which the breeze drew a sad, murmurous sound. 
Temple's first view is filled with the sights and sounds interacting and informing each other. We see, hear, and feel the Frenchman's place in its spatial and sensuous entirety. Um, Temple's movements throughout the novel within this building are dizzying. Uh, in contrast to Popeye, identified by his uh, doll-like qualities, as it's described in the novel, his lifelessness and actual impotence, Temple's epithet should really be, she whirled again. Temple's body is always in motion. It is her running and whirling that keeps her seeing and feeling beyond all physical boundaries. Her gaze is that of periphery, touch, and sound. Her gaze is of all architectures. Uh, in the words of Mer Merleau-Ponty, she leaves nothing hidden. Here's another excerpt. The hall was open through the house. She entered. Where are you going, Gowan said. Why don't you wait out here? She didn't answer. She went on down the hall. Beyond, behind her, she could hear Gowan's and the man's voices. The back porch lay in sunlight, a segment of sunlight framed by the door. Beyond, she could see a weed-choked slope and a huge barn, broken-backed, tranquil, in sunny desolation. To the right of the door, she could see the corner, either of a detached building or a wing of the house, Be but she could hear no sound save the voices from the front. She went on slowly, then she stopped. She emerged onto the back porch. She advanced again. Then she glanced quickly over her shoulder. With the tail of her eye, she thought she had seen a thread of smoke drift out of the door in the detached room where the porch made an L, but it was gone. Notice Faulkner's phrase, with the tail of her eye. Temple's gaze is not one of focalization, but one of periphery. In the following excerpts, Temple is physically contained in a room, yet still senses beyond the doors that should signify protection, impermeability, and structural sanctuary. As Heidegger theorizes, in looking at the door, Temple already passes through. Quote, Temple's head began to move. It turned slowly, as if she were following the passage of someone beyond the wall. It turned on to an excruciating degree. Then it turned back, slowly, as though pacing invisible feet beyond the wall." End quote. Whether she is looking through or behind, Temple is always sensing built spaces beyond the door. Once again, in his fictionalized Memphis, Faulkner constructs and deconstructs the myth of interiority through Temple's enveloping sense of architecture. We quickly discover that the gritty Memphis brothel is as porous and enveloping as the Frenchman place. Though she remains in her room, she senses beyond the door. Uh, she demonstrates in this following excerpt uh, synesthesia between sight and sound. Quote, holding the towel about her, she stole toward the door. Her ears acute her eyes a little blind with the strain of listening, she reached the door. At once she began to hear a hundred conflicting sounds in a single converging threat. Low down beyond the door, Temple could hear the dogs. Note the synesthesia of her eyes straining with listening. In the following excerpt, oral and visual beyond the door assume a color Temple sees sound in the brothel. Quote, she heard the door shut and the descending feet, the doctor's light, unceasing voice, and Miss Reba's labored breath grow twilight colored in the dingy hall and die away. Faulkner describes Temple's promiscuity of senses and how her being in the brothel becomes an enveloping experience for her. He, dis he transcends the philosophical limits of objectivism by allowing us to perceive and indeed feel the house, uh, despite our knowledge that she is hidden by the door. And I'll read you just one other excerpt. 
She discovered that the house was full of noises, seeping into the room, muffled and indistinguishable as though from a distance. A bell rang, faintly and shrilly, somewhere. Someone mounted the stairs in a swishing garment. The feet went on past the door and mounted another stair and ceased. She listened to the watch. A car started beneath the window in a grind of gears. Again, the faint bell rang, shrill and prolonged. She found that the faint light yet in the room was from a street lamp. Then she realized that it was the night and that the darkness beyond was full of the sound <coughs> of the city. The house was full of sounds, indistinguishable, remote. They came to her with a quality of awakening, resurgence, as though the house itself had been asleep. Rousing herself, arousing itself with dark, she heard something which might have been a burst of laughter in a shrill woman voice. Temple truly sees, hears, and feels the entire house. The source of terror in the novel emanates from the porosity and permeability of both building and body, of an architectonic world in which the door is no protection and there is no distinction between interior and exterior. In the person and perception of Temple Drake, Faulkner delivers and deconstructs the myth of the sanctuary, a hyper-interiorized, fantasized space in which the body and architectural interiors are sanctified and severed from threat. Instead of acting as a barrier between spaces, the doorway is a vehicle for Faulkner's discovery of the promiscuous body and structure. It fails to segregate forest and house, as Stoner points out, bodies or senses, the doorway as a means of protection or line of escape as it functions in Absalom Absalom is obsolete in the enveloping architecture of sanctuary. The author offers a way of relating material world uh, with ourselves <laughs> that transcends all definitions of modernist and postmodern aesthetics. Faulkner establishes the primacy of the world of the sensed world as truth, unfolding a space in which we are compelled to take up architectures beyond their seeming constructedness, beyond our vision, both with and in our bodies themselves. As Temple senses with her whole body, so we must read with ours. Thank you. Questions? <laughs> yes, Molly, thank you. <laughs> Can you talk a little bit more about her name, Temple, because it's being evocative of the structure itself? Yeah. I sense because you asked that, you have thoughts on I that. I actually don't. I just have this probing question. Yeah. I want to know. Yeah. Um, Throughout the novel, it's, it's interesting to think of uh, Temple Drake as a subject. I mentioned Faulkner and subjectivities. Um, and there's so much about both race and gender in Faulkner's work. But in Sanctuary, throughout, she, she keeps saying uh, to her really sexual aggressors, my father's a judge. Right? She's, she's a privileged young woman. Uh, and she keeps saying, my father's a judge. And she's criticized by a former prostitute who's also staying in the Frenchman place uh, for being kind of a tease, for being sexually unavailable. Um, so it's, uh, of course, in my mind, very purposeful that her name is Temple, uh, but also the notion that the body is safe, that the body can be, just as the structure, uh, a sanctuary. and. Uh, impervious, I impermeable to threatening forces. So I, I think her name is, is sort of ironic, uh, both maybe in a humorous way and in, in a not humorous way, in a very serious way as well. 
Uh, many scholars are, at least currently, are starting to talk about this novel as one that's part of uh, a, a rape culture. Yeah. Yeah, good question. And I enjoyed yes. your presentation greatly. Thank you. My question is of a more methodological uh, order, yeah. and that is um, uh, intuitive. It seems counterintuitive on first glance, and therefore very striking, yeah. and you orchestrate it very beautifully. It seems counterintuitive on first glance is this relationship that you stage between cultural studies and phenomenology. And I'd like to know more from you about um, your recent history in claiming that as um, uh, your way forward, your way in, your way across. Mm -hmm. That's that's a really important question, actually. <laughs> um, so in thinking about cultural studies and phenomenology, um, Walter Benjamin is, for me, an intersection of so many kinds of studies, uh, but I, I found so many overlapping uh, approaches, actually, to sensing and, and interacting with the material world, philosophically, between Benjamin and Merleau-Ponty. And I wasn't expecting that at all, actually, but you know, both uh, discuss this idea of, of taking up an architecture by, uh, by both sight and use. Right, so um, one cannot talk about the experience, uh, experiencing and living this world without thinking of the, what is material and also what is cultural, right? And Benjamin, of course, in one of my favorite works by him, uh, The Arcades Project, which if you ever, if you ever dare, uh, is just a pile of quotations. It, it's a plan for a much greater work but uh, he discusses how the 19th century gown or dress is like the unfolding of imperialism. Mm. So, so all philosophies are, are joined in material objects and, and culture, is, culture is inseparable from that. Yeah. Uh, other questions? Please. Let me just ask, oh please. Oh, no, 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 I was, I was going to uh, claim time to nobody else was, so please go ahead. Uh, my question is also the idea of the stru the structural component, as well as almost a mental, mentally schema schematic use of the doorway. Um, say in the work, say in the work of say Kenton Compton, <coughs> say a sound of fury. Um, and I have no, and I, I'm not as aware of Faulkner as you would be. I'm not a big Faulkner expert, but um, is it? Could you, could you? Is it possible to think of the idea of the doorway more, moreover, as the way of the schematic towards the rest, towards the rest of the, the characters' actions, their own their own thought processes, more than just uh, walking through the door, and also and also and also planning what the action the actions the thoughts the uh, influence of the object of the architecture on their thoughts as well. I just want to uh, make sure I'm getting the second part. Um, so, not not simply the relationship that I'm claiming, but also. Uh, the impact, uh, the relationship between the thoughts and actions? Yes. Pass, uh, like, through, throughout the North Mag, past the doorway into the, into the rest of the world as well. Yeah. It, as, it was something that you brought up uh, briefly in the you know, uh, beginning of your beginning that I just wanted a little more elaboration on it, which is probably have. Yeah. No, that, that's an excellent question. Uh, and in which direction, if we're thinking about causality, right, to put it simply, uh, causality, um, do, d do architectures direct and organize us if we could make this a binary or is it the other way around, right? Do, do they build us or do we build them? And almost everyone would say, well, both, right? Um, but in, in that case, um, I, I do think it's important to consider uh, how the doorway um, imposes cultural attitudes onto, uh, let's say, the character, but of course on us, since we're the readers. Um, so Benjamin actually writes in his section in the Arcades Project, uh, in his opening section, on the Roman archway 
in, in Paris. And uh, I think he calls this mythic topology or, or mythic topography. Uh, and how once that arch was set into place, every person passing under experiences the grandeur of victory, right? The grandeur of war. And as Faulkner would say, I suppose apotheosis. So that's a great point. Um, and in, in the Compson house, of course, we have a family who's uh, lost the Old South, as has everyone else in Faulkner's fiction. And they're constantly passing in and out of this old plantation house, uh, which is filled with remnants of uh, an imperialist past. Absolutely. Yeah. I wish I had more time to talk about The Sound That's and the enough. Fury. It's enough. Okay. <laughs> it is enough. You're right. <laughs> yeah. Go ahead. I wanted yeah. to ask you. I, I love your talk, actually. Thank you very much. Thank um, you. I wanted to ask have you thought at all about, or is it part of your project to think about how the doorway functions as a, as a guide to formal aspects of Faulkner's novels? I can think of lots of ways in which the doorway as a concept works in poetry and in drama, but not being a novel expert so the actual aesthetics of the novel or or structures or yeah. strategies of, of narrative or any any mm -hmm. formal kind of approach where the, where the door be being stuck in doorways characters who are stuck in their situations or yes stuck in the past you know liminal spaces i i, I honestly yeah. don't know because i don't know about Faulkner, but i just it strikes me as a no, uh, you're absolutely right. And, um, you know, I was thinking about in this novel, uh, the character I was referring to, uh, who's a former prostitute and living amongst all these bootleggers, uh, she is someone who's always depicted standing in the doorway. And she's, al she's always just in transition. You know, she's not really going anywhere. And Papa, is, as well, is in the doorway, which is a distinguishing feature. But... I think that's necessary. I think I ha have to address that as I'm as I'm working through this text. Yeah. Um, thank you. Uh, other questions. Kara. <laughs> it was a really lovely talk. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, I guess your talk about Faulkner and doorways got me thinking about um, other spaces and other thresholds and other doorways and other modernist texts. Yeah. So um, I'm thinking about the famous opening scene of Mrs. Dalloway when she's in three spaces, if you can think of it that way. She's in three spaces at once. Um, mm. I'm thinking about Joyce and Bloom's Dublin and that Joyce wrote that not in Dublin and yet they have said famously that you can reconstruct Dublin if it ever dies in a fire based on the <laughs> um, Right. So I guess I'm wondering if you could speak more to the rest of your project, because oh, I want to know yeah. more about the other ways you're using thresholds and doorways and architecture, um, subject-object divides in, in other works. I would love that. OK. Uh, so this is, this is supposed to be the first chapter of my dissertation. And there's a lot, there's quite a lot that I wasn't able to say because of time limitations. Uh, some of this study is also having to do with the research I did when I was in Oxford, Mississippi uh, last summer. And um, it has quite a lot to do with the formal architecture of, of the South and its relation to politics, actually, and the politics of the novel. Um, but the other chapters, one is on Wolf. And I'm really looking at her, her last work, Between the Acts. Uh, I'm thinking about uh, this idea of in-between spaces and pauses, which happens so frequently uh, throughout the novel. Uh, I'm also thinking about Kafka's America, which was his first novel. Um, but I'm, I'm thinking about his kind of useless apparatuses that he's famous for in so many other texts and how that, that plays out as uh, a threshold in, in the novel. And finally, uh, actually Joyce in relation to Colm Tobin, uh, a change from modern 
supposedly uh, modernist to postmodern aesthetics and how spaces are narrated differently um, with those changing aesthetics. Does that, does that work? <laughs> oh. <laughs> uh, any other questions? No. Thank you. I'm sure everybody else is seen that. That was very nice. Um, so thank you very much. Um, but I was wondering if you, at any point, because you talk about Heidegger, who I'm very interested in. Um, of course. Yeah. Um, so I, I was wondering if you had, I, was one, I want to ask a question about Heidegger. I thought of like uh, when it says poetically man dwells, dwelling is root in your existence, so much that we build that we're making. But I thought the another question perhaps, um, uh, Heidegger's idea of like the risk, like the divide, so yes. I think that is um, sort of a little bit the, the, the fracture. Or the, no, I mean, it's, it's called risk, but it's like a, a thousand ways you can interpret it. Mm -hmm. If that factors at all into your work, because he says, like, in the, in the risk, I think it says it's the risk where the creation comes, where something is built, it's sort of like in a crack. Um, I knew somebody else who was doing the work on pain, because I think talks about pain as well, and that's sort of like the divide. And, and that separates and it joins together at the same time, much yeah. like the door looking ah. from one space to another. It, at, the si at the same time that it divides those two, those two spaces, it actually brings them together and the creation takes place there. You uh, mentioned, now I'm forgetting a lot of my Heidegger, but he's, like, he talks about how the writing occurs in the list and making the building, if it, like, something like that occurs in the list. I just wanted to know if you, if you did any stuff on that, stuff on <laughs> yeah, <laughs> is is this from building dwelling thinking? Um, I think it's from uh, poetically man dwells. Oh yeah, okay. Um, which I thought was I was confused. That I thought it was in building dwelling thinking. thinking. It's not. I will look into that. It's I mean it's actually very close to what he's saying about uh, the doorway in some ways, um, although the division the division aspect isn't there. Okay. I'm so glad you mentioned that. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I just want to know if you, if you, in the rest of your project, if you, uh, if you had talked about that or did that factor in, because I'm very used to like that idea. I'll look into bit, it. Maybe it was a bit of a selfish question. No, <laughs> <laughs> no, I love that you said it. Thank you. Uh, other, any other questions? Do, do we have time? I can do something really selfish right now, and that is I have a few uh, photos to show you and talk a little bit about those. Do you want to see some architecture? Yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I could pretend that I don't have them prepared and ready, but I do. <laughs> okay. Uh, so the, uh, the photo that was in the, uh, the poster is from uh, an amazing collection by Martin Dane, who traveled to Oxford in 1964, just a couple of years after Faulkner passed, um, and uh, finished the, the photos he had already started. Um, but here's one, right, from toward the end of Faulkner's life, where he's entering the barn on his property at Roanoke. That's R-O-W-A-N space O-A-K. And uh, Faulkner uh, named the house so after his reading of Fraser's A Golden Bow, which, you know, A Golden Bow and Ulysses were the two works that Faulkner took with him everywhere. And his, his copies were filled with notes. Uh, so this was a Scottish tradition to nail the rowan oak to the door as a uh, symbol of protection. Right. So this is the barn on his property. That's just for, <laughs> for aesthetics. Uh, what are, I, I, I just wanted to talk about um, Southern architecture in general. Many of you are familiar with Greek Revival style, and I have a couple of examples here. Did you have a question? Because, yeah, I know. OK. <laughs> yeah, so you know. Good. Uh, and uh, m many of the architectural books I've I've examined so far tell the same story about Greek Revival buildings and their past in Oxford. And that is that all Greek Revival plantation houses are built on the same form. Uh, originally, as you see at the top left-hand corner, the, the one-room cabin 
right, with the gallery and the, the portico on the front. Uh, eventually, the two rooms divided by a single hallway going through, that's called a dog trot. And um, in, in the pioneer days, supposedly, uh, dogs would sleep in the hallway as, as the <coughs> guests from, you know, the visiting guests would sleep in the two uh, <coughs> quarters. Right, and, and eventually this, this form just developed. It just evolved into a more modern plantation house of the 1850s, but always holding on to that structure and you know, adding a gallery to the back. So you have the front and back porch. Uh, eventually you'd, you'd have the <coughs> kitchen added on to the back of the house, making that L shape, which Faulkner notes in Sanctuary. Right, so it's very, uh, it's very accurate and descriptive. Okay, so it's a couple of these I took, not the first one, uh, but this one. Uh, this is the Lyceum building on campus. This is just an example of Greek revival, uh, and and actually Civil War uh, Confederate soldiers were housed there. It was used as a, as a hospital at one point. Um, Okay, here's Roanoke. Here is uh, Faulkner's house, right? Uh, what many theorists, uh, architects talk about in regards to architectures like this one is that it is, in fact, political, which would not come as a surprise to any of you. Um, we, we'd probably call this an architecture of power, right? The, the former owner of Roanoke before Faulkner moved in, um, two owners back in the 1850s, Reverend Robert Chagog uh, owned over 6,000 acres of land and approximately 90 slaves, right? Um, I took this one. <laughs> okay, so here you see the floor plan of uh, Roanoke. Right? And once again, the kitchen is at the back. There's an L shape. You have the front portico and the back. Right? Here's uh, a house. I did actually take this one. Uh, built by William Turner. He built many of the plantation houses in Oxford in the 1850s. This is Cedar Oaks. He designed it himself. But you can see the same form is actually on the top floor, uh, bottom and top dog trot, right? It's, it's a dog trot on, on top and bottom. Um, okay, and finally, this is the Ship Plantation House. Uh, a doctor lived here in the 19th century, and it was abandoned by the 1920s. This was, everyone claims, this was the inspiration for the Frenchman place in Sanctuary, the one that Temple describes at the beginning of the novel. Here's another. Um, eventually, it was burned down. Someone just burned it down, and everyone just let it. Everyone just let it burn down. Um, why am I telling you all this? Well, um, what, I'm, what I'm finding in, in architectural theory is that there really is this Western tradition that many architects, architects claim is ocular-centric, uh, that architecture throughout history in the West has been built for vision and for uh, focalization instead of periphery, that all the buildings we experience are built for aesthetics and not for the experiencing body. Uh, so it's, it is uh, important, I think, that in all of these southern houses uh, there is focalization which historically is tied with patriarchy um, and also hegemony. Uh, so at this point, I'm really thinking about this project as also a political one, a way in which Faulkner is writing against 19th century uh, imperialism through the person of Temple Drake. Um, I think that's the end of it, yeah. Uh, any questions about those? You said um, that is the door being focused, like uh, the focalization, is it on the door? Yes. So is there, um, 
have you thought at all about like side doors and like alternate exits and entrances? Right. Is there anything there like that, like a door exit or like entryways that aren't being focused on? Do you mean in in these houses? Yeah. Or, or, oh. or like I guess yeah, in that's general, interesting. In, uh, in the idea of doorways, I guess if it, in the southern house, like or windows, like you were saying, is yeah. there? No, that's interesting. And now that you say it, it's all the more significant that the windows are an escape route for so many women yeah, in right. Faulkner's novels, right? Uh, and in Sanctuary, the the hallway is narrated as this very this very linear path for all the all the male characters. Uh, Temple doesn't do that. She's not focused on the door. Uh, she's seeing and sensing everything other than the door, um, absolutely. Uh, and and the, the theorist I mentioned earlier, Jill Stoner, she talks about minor and major architectures, right? And she cites Kafka's uh, ways of getting out of, of escaping a building in the trial, for example, as a minor architecture, as a way of finding an escape, right? right? It's kind of kind of fighting the man, right? It's, yeah. Um, other, any other questions? Yes. Thanks for a really wonderful talk. <coughs> and the images as well. Um, this is, I should know the answer to this question, but I can't remember what it is. Where did Faulkner do his writing? Was it in oh. the big estate or was it <coughs> elsewhere? Uh, in many places, his the the really productive period between 1929 and 1936, uh, most of that was done in Roanoke, right after he married, uh, and he bought the house. But before that, he stayed in a place for for two years. He did some earlier writing in New Orleans, uh, but the bulk of it was in in Roanoke. In in the, in the house itself, or was he one of these writers who had? A writer's shack oh. from the main estate. Oh, no. He was in his study, and he used to, I think he said that he got this idea from Melville, actually, that he would lock himself into his study uh, and not come out for five or six hours. And then in the afternoons, he'd, you know, take out the horses, play a game with, with someone in town. So the door there functioned as uh, the... Device yes. To no, that's the generation of the fantasy world doors. Yes, that's true. Yeah. Uh, and actually, about doorways, it is rumored that he married his wife on the steps to the church, since she was married before, and they wouldn't allow them into the church itself. So there is Falker as the boy outside yeah. the door, <laughs> waiting to be let in or not caring, more likely, more than likely. Yeah. Thanks. Thank you.